think like an Israelite to get what's going on in the Old Testament. You need to think like a first century Jew to process a lot of what's going on in your Bible. And that is really difficult for us because obviously we're not first century Jews. We're not ancient Semites. And because we're not, there's a lot in the text that just goes right over our heads. It just goes right by us. It's not because we're not good readers, we're not smart, it's it, none of that. It's just we are not immersed in the culture. We are not immersed in the way of thinking. We haven't had traditions, accrued traditions, um, rabbis, teachers, whatever, generations long, informing us how to think about the text. Well, a Jew in the first century had that. An ancient Israelite had that. What they knew was passed on to them, and it was passed through certain filters, and those are missing for us. We have our own filters that don't really help. We have filters like the Reformation. It's not that the Reformation was bad, but it was the 16th and 17th centuries, which is considerably removed from what it meant to be an ancient Israelite, an ancient Semite. I'm saying all that to say this. I'm going to say some things tonight, and I'm necessarily going to go quickly. But I'm going to say some things tonight that are going to sound really strange. <laughs> I'm, I'm forewarning you in a, in a good way, in a positive way, because there was a time in my own education, my own self-education, that what some of the things I will say tonight would have sounded really strange to me, too. But I want to try to show you enough that you can sort of internalize the culture and internalize the mindset, the worldview, that will help us become informed as to what, how an ancient reader would have looked at this stuff. And by doing that, you will begin to see patterns. You will begin to see connections. What you might have been thinking is that we would talk about things like this. Yeah, I'll, I'll hit on some of these things maybe not tonight, maybe in successive weeks. But these things, as familiar as they are, are, a, are just a tiny, tiny portion of Jesus' relationship to the Old Testament. They're just a tiny portion of what an ancient person would have been expecting, would have been thinking when a New Testament writer wrote something or when Peter or Paul or whoever it was would have said something and quoted the Old Testament. There's a very wide context that I want to use this session to sort of set and overview where we're going to go in the process. Now, I put this passage up. I can find my Job reference here. These two verses, 7 and 8, you think, why in the world would you start there? I think you'll be able to figure that out after a few minutes, but these are... Theologically, some of the two of the, the more pregnant, the theologically pregnant verses in the Old Testament. Are you the first man who was born? One of Job's friends asks him. Now, this is in the dialogues about uh, they're trying to assess Job's situation and trying to pin down why he's suffering. Of course, he's defending himself. And they ask him, Are you the first man who was born? Well, who, who is the first man who was born? He wasn't born, but in their mind, he had a beginning. Were you brought forth before the hills? Well, no. That's, again, creation language, the mountains and the hills and all that stuff. Have you listened in the counsel of God? Do you limit wisdom to yourself? Now, next week, we're going to talk a lot about wisdom. But you can store that, this reference away for that time. There was this idea that the first man had listened in the counsel of God. The first man was right there with God in Eden. And this idea of being intimately related with God begins all the way back with Adam. And that's where I'm going to begin tonight. Okay. So things going on in Eden with Adam, believe it or not, I'm going to try to go from there all the way to the end of the Old Testament <laughs> in one hour. But I'm going to, I'm going to hit certain motifs, certain threads that run through the Old Testament, all of which in some way relate to national Israel and Jesus, and they get merged together in the end. 
of the story. So let's go back here and jump in here. Humanity and Eden. All the slides are going to look the same, at least for the first maybe 10 or so. On the left hand, we have ruler or father. Who is in charge? Who's the, who's the ruler of everything that there is to rule? Who is being ruled? And I'm using the words subjects because that denotes rulership above, but also family. Okay, God has a family. God is naturally going to be the ruler. He has a family, but he also has an administration, a bureaucracy. We fit into both those categories. And then there is human mediation. And I'm going to trace these three topics through the Old Testament and point out some things along the way. In the beginning, God, who was a spirit, okay, God is a spirit, Jesus tells us that, is present ruling. And I have the word embodied in purple here. When I talk about divine embodiment, that's going to be in purple. And I'm getting that from Genesis 3.8. Again, I'm going to go quickly. If you have questions, you can write them down. We'll take questions at the end. And I won't be able to really pause and lay all this stuff out for you, at least in this week. But if you recall back in the garden in Genesis 3.8, they hear the sound. Okay, it takes a physical object to make a sound, scientifically. They hear the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. There are certain terms in Genesis 3 associated with just that simple verse that show up later in the Old Testament in theophany appearances. Now, who knows what a theophany is? Right. Right. It's some sort of appearance of deity. And in many cases, I know we don't often think of it, but in many cases there's actually embodiment going on. There are, again, some terms in Gen all the way back to Genesis 3 that show up later when God is you know, in the whirlwind with Job and God is on the mountain at Sinai. There are links, believe it or not, that begin all the way back in Genesis 3. Humanity at this time, well, yeah, we're servants because we're under God and everybody's a servant under God. But we're also co-rulers. And I get that from Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Humanity is created, you know, our translations say, in the image of God. I think a better translation is as the image of God. We are created as divine representatives. We are to represent him. We're to do what God wants us to do as though he were physically there present uh, with him. Everybody's together, though. There is no sort of negative connotation between being a servant. You're a servant, but you're also a co-ruler. Theologians like to say that the, the original humans were servant kings, which I kind of like. has a nice picture to it. That's the way everything starts out. We are, the, the humans were children of God. And sometimes because of uh, the Old Testament culture, the, the phrase is sons of God, because it's, it's patriarchal to that extent. But it's inclusive. It means children, male and female, he created them. And their task was to administer the kingdom of God on earth. Now, think about Eden. Eden is where God lives. Okay, it's his address in the beginning. It's also where he issues decrees. He is there with his heavenly host, who existed before humanity did. Elsewhere in the Bible, the, the, the heavenly host is referred to as a council, okay, a divine council. It's, it's, it's basically, basically a bureaucracy, but it's also a family. We get plurals in Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Let us create humankind in our image. But then we also get singulars. So God, singular, created them in his image. You get singular and plural. There's an interchange there between God and this group, the heavenly host. And somehow humans come on the scene and we're like them, but we're different. But we're sort of doing the same kinds of things. We're working for God. The kingdom of God is on earth. It's just situated in this place called Eden because this is the beginning. The human mediator really is Adam because... Frankly, at the beginning, he's the only, the only one mentioned in that role. And we go back to Job. Are you like the first man who listened in the council? So Adam is attending the council meetings, so to speak. He has access to wisdom. And in a, a week from tonight, we'll talk about wisdom 
in Proverbs 8 gets personified, gets pictured as a person who is a co-creator with God. That might be new to some of you. Look up Proverbs 8, verses 22 to 31. Wisdom is the co-creator with God. And the Old Testament authors do something with that. And the New Testament authors do something with that. And I'll preface next week's talk by saying, or by asking this question. Where do the New Testament authors get the idea that Jesus was the co-creator? I mean, you look in Genesis 1, there's like nobody else there. You look in some of the other creation passages in the Psalms, where is anybody else? I mean, you, you look at that and you have to wonder, and people have asked, well, where did they get that idea? Because it's in Colossians 1, it's in 1 Corinthians 8, it's in Romans 11. Right? It's in John chapter 1, of course. Where did they get that? Okay, that's a little preview. They, they're, they're getting it from their Old Testament in some fairly cryptic ways. Now, there was a problem, of course. We have the fall. Humanity is removed from where God lives and where God works, where God and his heavenly host, his counsel, do their thing. Humankind is driven away. So we have a change in status. Human beings are, are after this point, they're not going to be co-rulers anymore. That's been disrupted. It's been ruined. It's been put on probation. What we have is we have a change in status, but God forgives them, forgives Adam and Eve, and says, amid the curses, you know, what we're going to have to do here is someday one of your seed, Eve, somebody who's going to come from you, and, and you're human, so that would be a human being, someday there's going to be a human being that comes along that undoes what you've just done. It's going to reverse what you've just done. But until that point, see you later. You've got to get out of here. We're not going to let you in Eden anymore. But it's not the end of the story. So we have a, a sense of, of a deliverer who has to be human. The deliverer is going to, again, because they're human, they're going to be some kind of servant. Now, look, I want you to tune into the language I'm using. Deliverer, servant, human. Okay. There's a bloodline. There's a royal bloodline because Adam was, was a co-ruler. Humans were init initially in the Old Testament story designed to be co-ruling. They had, they had royal status with God, with the king. So there's some sense of that going on too. And we have the emergence of evil. We have a competing interest over against the interest of God. Now if we move it up to Eden from Eden to the flood, we get some of the same things. Who's the ruler? Well, God. There's also the language of embodiment here, very early in the Old Testament. And I have here Genesis 5, 22, 24, and 6, 9. This is going to be, sound really odd, but go look it up. You're going, to, you're going to be a little surprised like I was when I first saw this. These three references refer to people who, quote, walked with God. Now, we use that phrase all the time. If you actually look that up, walk with God, like in your Logos software, you're going to find that that phrase only occurs three or four times in the entire Bible and none in the New Testament. Zero. Nobody is said to walk or have walked with God in the New Testament. Again, even though we use that all the time. Now, Humans are commanded in both Testaments to walk before God and be obedient. But when God is doing the walking, when he's participating in the walking, that is a really rare phrase. And since the first occasion of this was Genesis 3, okay, the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden, and that has theophanic language that occurs elsewhere in the Old Testament. Scholars contend, and I would agree, that this language here, walking with God, used twice of Enoch and once of Noah, that that has something to do with a direct divine encounter and a direct divine relationship. It's very unusual. But we have it in this period of these three people. 
Deuteronomy 23.14, I don't have a link to it. You're going to see this language used two more times here in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. And it refers to what's going on in the camp of Israel, where God says, I'm, I'm walking, I will walk in your midst. Well, what was going on in the camp of Israel during the Pentateuch period? You know, Moses, Sinai. Was God, in, was God completely invisible? No, he wasn't. There could be a pillar of fire, there could be a pillar of cloud, and even more dramatically, a human form. We're going to talk about the human form tonight. But while all that's going on, God refers to what he's doing there, or what the embodied Yahweh is doing there, saying, I'm going to walk in your midst. Okay, so obey, that sort of thing. It's a very unusual, sort of, it's a very unusual circumstance. Humans, of course, are servants as a result of the fall. We've lost sort of that, that upper status. We're still children or the family of God because there aren't that many people. The population is growing now. But it's becoming wicked in the wake of or in concert with a divine rivalry or rebellion. Now that harkens back to Genesis 3. But it also speaks of Genesis 6. Regardless of what your view of Genesis 6 is, when the sons of God go into the daughters of men, and they father children known as the Nephilim, the mighty men of renown, so on and so forth. From that point, that passage is going to get referenced in both Testaments. And when it does, it's the idea that you again have a competing human and quasi-divine opposition to what's going on with the human promise. Remember the human one that has to come and fix all this stuff. And that bloodline okay, and human warfare that extends from it as well. Because when you get to the wars of Joshua, those things are blurred and mixed. So you have a competing interest going on. The interest now is preserving what, what we have. Who, who are the human mediators? Well, it is anyone who can be defined as a prophet. Anyone who, and I'm defining prophet very loosely because Jesus does. Remember here in Luke 11:51, Luke Jesus refers to the prophets all the way from righteous Abel to Zechariah, who was slain at the altar. Okay, he goes all the way back to Abel. Basically, a prophet is someone who has had a direct encounter with God and who speaks for God. That's it. Not somebody who predicts the future. It's very wide and open. And if you look at who we have here, we have Abel, who is the one that Jesus starts with. We've already seen Adam when he was the only one there. Seth, we've never, the text doesn't call Seth this, but Seth is viewed as sort of an initial, an initial fulfillment of the seed promise in Genesis because Abel was killed and God replaces him. Eve says, I've gotten another man. I've gotten a man with the help of the Lord. Because for sure, the good line ain't going through that cane. <laughs> I mean, that ain't going to happen. So God replaces Abel with Seth, so I'm including him here. But we do have Enoch and Noah. Again, direct divine encounter. They speak for God. Both of them, in Jude 4 and 2 Peter 2, are called herod, heralds or prophets. They prophesy. They speak for God. Again, I want you to start noticing patterning, patterns. The Bible is, I don't know if you know what fractals are, but sometimes we get stuck in, 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 in a real simple sort of relationship like typology. Typology is interesting. It happens, of course, in Scripture. But what's even more deep and more meshed and more, sometimes you've got to dig for it, is patterning, vocabulary, words, phrases, ideas that just pop up all over the place throughout the history of the story. Of course, we have a problem here. We have Genesis 6, 5, humankind is generally evil. There's a pollution of humanity's line. There's a reason why Noah is singled out, because he walks with God, 
and he was pure in his generations. Whatever's going on in Genesis 6, verses 1 through 4, Noah is not part of it. There's a reason why Noah shows up in the genealogy of Jesus. Because Matthew, or Luke in this case, wants to be very clear that Jesus not only goes back to David and back to Abraham, he goes through Noah and Enoch to Adam. Okay, you have to establish this line. Okay, there's a reason for that. Babel, this is one of the critical moments of the Old Testament story. We have a state of chaos. There's no mention of divine embodiment. There is a divine sort of conversation or decree to the council. This is the other passage where you get plural language when God sees what's going on at Babel. He just told them to disperse and multiply. You know, do that Noah, Noahic covenant thing, like I told you. And God sees that they're not, and he says, you know, Yahweh goes down, and then he says to his council, let us go down and put a stop to this. There's some little sense of urgency there. Because if we don't, nothing will be impossible to them. It's just like Genesis 3 in some sense, where the fallout as well is, is the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, we can talk about that a little bit later. But basically, it's, it's a presumption of authority that you don't have. You're an imager of God, but you are not at the status of those who decree fate and calamity, good and evil, for humanity. You are not at that level. Okay? You share the authority given to you, but you ain't got this. Okay, you are not, as Genesis 3.22 says, when after the fall, it says now that the, the man has become as one of us, knowing good and evil. It's the same thing here. If we don't put a stop to this, humankind is going to be able, or they're going to try to assert this authority before it's time, before God <clears throat> decreed when they should have it. So we have a decision made by God to disperse humanity, but that isn't all he does. That might be how we're familiar with it, because there are other passages that talk about what happened at Babel. Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9, and I have here a note that I'm reading with the LXX and the Dead Sea Scrolls. If you have an ESV, good for you, because you'll agree with me. <laughs> uh, the ESV says, when the Most High divided up the nations, he divided them up according to the number of the sons of God. Okay. Most English Bibles do not say that. Most of them have the sons of Israel. And there's a textual difference there. Dead Sea Scrolls, Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, has sons of God. It has to be sons of God because if you go back and look at the table of nations, Israel isn't there. It doesn't exist yet. It can't be sons of Israel. Okay, but there was a, a later change made to the text in that tradition. But the correct text is preserved for us by providence. We also have Deuteronomy 4.19.20. Basically, in a nutshell, what happens at Babel is look, God says, look, we've tried to rule with human beings first as co-rulers and then try to sort of reestablish my rule on earth and get back to Eden, and it just isn't working. You're disobedient again. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to confuse your languages and scatter you over the earth. And not only that, but I'm going to divide you up, and I'm going to assign you to one of the sons of God. I'm going to put lesser beings who work for me, members of the heavenly host, you're going to report to them, and they're going to report to you. You're, you're, you're made for each other. Okay, I'm done being your sovereign. I'm disinheriting you from the family because I'm going to start over. And that's why chapter 12 of Genesis, right after Babel, is what? The call of Abraham. God disinherits the nations. And this is the Old Testament rationale. If you go to Deuteronomy 4, 19, 20, it says that the nations were allotted to these other beings, and they were supposed to worship them, not worship Yahweh. I had enough of you. It's the Romans' one event of the Old Testament, God giving them up to their own desires. I'm going to start a new family. So long. Bye. Now you can have these for God's.
and they work for me, so I want them to do a good job. And yeah, I can rightly say I'm the only deity, I'm the only God who is pre-existent, creator, and deserves to be worshipped. But you're under them now. I've had enough. Now in the back of God's mind, God knows that the nations are rightfully his. And he's going to have a plan to get them back. But for now, he's had enough. He's up to here. So God has no human heir at the moment. So there we have a issue. And there's no kingdom among men. There's no mediator. No one's a prophetic figure in the era. We have a divine disinheriting, and God decides to start over with Abraham, who not coincidentally, the writer makes sure to, to tell us that he comes from the line of Noah and Enoch. Just want to make that clear. Because yeah, we're still going back to Adam. Patriarchs. God, again, is the ruler, the father figure. And here you get a lot of divine embodiment. God shows up in human form to the patriarchs with some regularity. Either referring to himself or he's referred to as the word. Doesn't that sound familiar? Or as some sort of man who we find out later in the narrative isn't really a man. It's called Elohim. A couple examples uh, with Abraham in Genesis 12. It says, the word of the Lord came to Abraham. Now we think, oh, Abraham must have heard a sound, you know. Well, if you read the rest of the narrative, if you read Genesis 15, if you read some other passages that refer back to that event, you find out that Abraham saw Yahweh. It wasn't just in his hearing. It was seeing. It was visual. This happens to Isaac as well. In fact, in Acts 7, 2, Stephen's speech, he, Stephen says point blank that Yahweh appeared to Abraham just uses the you know, point-blank term, appeared. Happens to Isaac. Happens to Jacob. Okay, the three patriarchal figures. So we have God ruling. Why do I keep referring to embodiment? Because God is there. He's supervising. He's the sovereign. But when God wants to interact with people, he has to... He has a problem. God's problem is, well... You know, if I really showed you what I am, you wouldn't know what to do. <laughs> you wouldn't know how to process it. Because I am so other that it would just be pointless. Not only that, but where else do we hear in the what else do we hear in the Old Testament about if if people really see the presence, if they really see the glory, what happens to them? You die. So God has a problem. I don't want you. I want. I want to kill you. I mean, I'd like to converse a little bit. Yeah, I'd like you to, and I'd like you to know that somebody's there. But if I just kind of show up, you're going to die. So that's just kind of pointless. So what God does is He appears in ways that human beings can process with their senses. Sometimes it's a cloud. Sometimes it's a fire. In other cases, it's a human form. You know, this is different than the incarnation, but you can see where the relationship is. This is different from the incarnation in that the incarnation has God upping the ante a little bit. God has actually born a human with all the frailties associated thereof. This is why the incarnation was such a shock when the New Testament writers would, would speak of it. The Jews, they knew their own Bible. They're used to this idea of divine embodiment. Yeah, God shows up as a person and they, there's conversations. But the idea that God would, for lack of a better word, risk actually being born as a human being, that was a little, that, that was kind of, kind of scary. But if they were tracking with the Old Testament, when we get to the end of this tonight, you'll see why that was the only way it could, have, it could have happened. That's the only way all the things converge. It was a necessity. But God comes to the patriarchs. He says to Abraham, guess what? You're going to have a kid. Yeah, yeah, I know you can't. Don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. So there's a miraculous birth with Isaac. Out of that comes Israel, the nation, Jacob's name change and all that. So in a very real sense, the Israelites are God's children 
He's responsible for them being there. And they're also spiritual children as well. God now has a, a line on earth and a kingdom. Now, our figures, of course, are the patriarchs. It's kind of interesting. Who are the enemies that Abraham runs into in Genesis 14? Come on, this is a Bible verse I expect all of you to have memorized. <laughs> that, that list of nations, Genesis 14. It's kind of interesting. If it's, wearing or bored, if it's weird or boring, it must be important. Okay, in the days of Amraphel, so on and so forth, who does Abraham run into? Verse 5. The Rephaim, the Zuzim, the Amim, and the Horites, the Amalekites, and also the Amorites. Are those names familiar? They're the same names that show up where? in the days of Moses and Joshua. And it turns out that there's something unusual about those people groups. We'll get to. Something else happens to Abraham. He meets Melchizedek. Of course, we know Melchizedek from Genesis 14. We know him from Psalm 110. That's pretty much it. Yeah, Hebrews 11. You know, kind of Hebrews 8 actually throws a few things in there about Melchizedek. Why is Melchizedek noteworthy? He is the priest of Salem, Salem in Shemitic. In Semitic, it would be Shalem. What is Shalem? Anybody? It means peace, but it's also Jerusalem. Again, Hebrews eight tells us, and Psalm one ten says that he has. He was unique. He was noteworthy because he had an eternal priesthood. Now, to have an eternal priesthood, I would suggest that you probably need to be eternal. And this is the way Melchizedek was taken in first century Judaism, in middle Judaism, the second temple period. Melchizedek was viewed as a divine figure, a divine being. Because we can't have all these other, and when we get to the end, it'll, it'll converge for you. But the fact that we have a priesthood that is not from Aaron is important. Because Messiah is never connected with Aaron. He's not from that tribe. He needs a priesthood that sort of operates out here okay, to do all those things. What does Melchizedek offer Abraham, by the way? Bread and wine. What a coincidence. Moses, Aaron, and Israel. God is still the ruler. Again, lots of divine embodiment here. Exodus chapter 3, who is in the bush? God's in the bush. Yeah, who else? Yeah, the angel of Yahweh is in the bush. And you go back to Acts chapter 7, Stephen's sermon, he tells you the same thing because Stephen's reading his Old Testament. The angel is in the bush. We get lots of appearances of the angel. Exodus 33 1 to 11 is kind of interesting. Moses used to take the tent, pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp. He called it the tent of meeting. Again, Moses has lots of experiences here with a direct encounter with God. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of the cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent. The Lord would speak with Moses. When all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship, each at his tent door. Well, he's back. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face, so on and so forth. And here we have Joshua. When Moses turned again to the camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Okay, that's going to become important because Joshua is going to have the same divine encounters that Moses did. Exodus 23, also associated somewhat with the pillar. God tells Moses when they're, going to, when they're heading out into the wilderness after they leave Sinai, he says, I'm going to send my angel with you. And you better listen to him because my name is in him. He will not forgive sins. My name is in him. Deuteronomy 4.37 helps us understand what that means. <clears throat> 
Because he loved your fathers and chose their offspring after, the, after them and brought you out of Egypt with his own presence. The name is the presence of God. It is the glory. It is what God is. And that thing, what God was, was inside this angel. The angel was the embodiment of Yahweh. And it went with Israel for the whole trip. Every day. Everybody got to see it. At least if you could see the front of the camp. Everybody got to see that. So much so, when, they get, when you get to the book of Judges, Joshua's died, and it's like, well, we still haven't you know, taken the land like we were supposed to. The angel shows up at a place called Bochim, which means weeping. Why is it weeping? Because the angel says, you still haven't done what you're supposed to do. I'm out of here. And he leaves. And the people sat there and wept. That's why the place is called Bochim unto this day. Because they'd had it for 40 years. Every day. Divine embodiment. Yahweh in human form. Right there on the scene. And they still didn't do it. All this stuff happening again, Moses and Joshua's day. Moses is called the servant, God's servant. He represented the nation at large. He was also a prophet. Remember Deuteronomy 18, prophesying that there would be a, a prophet someday that would rise up you know, to the level of Moses. Of course, the New Testament applies that to Jesus. It's also during Moses' time that God calls Israel as a whole, as a nation, my son. When they go into Pharaoh, you know, God tells them, when you go into Pharaoh, you, here's what you say. Let my son go into the wilderness that he can offer sacrifice to me. Israel's called my son. Makes sense because that's God's family. Israel is reborn and redeemed from Egypt, which restarts the kingdom among men. Our mediator, again, is Moses. We're going to skip the whole law dispensed by angels, which is mentioned four times, three or four times in the New Testament. Where do they get that idea? Well, they get it from the Old Testament. Kingdom of priests. Okay, yeah, Aaron gets to see divine embodiment as well. So he becomes a prophetic figure of importance. But God reminds them that, look, what I really want you to do is I want you all to be a priest. I want you to be a kingdom of priests. I want you to all be this. Problem. They fail at Kadesh. This is when they're going to go into the land and they send in the 12 spies. They come back and two of them say, yeah, let's go. Let's go get it. Ten of them say, forget it. Why do they get scared? Because the Anakim are in the land. Numbers 13, verse 33. The Anakim are descendants of the Nephilim. Where do we get them? Genesis 6. Here, the whole competing human and quasi-divine bloodline thing starts to emerge again. They are standing in the way of the kingdom. They are standing in the way of God's son. They are standing in the way of kingship. They are standing in the way of fill in the blank. Okay, all these motifs. And they fail. We can't do it. So, they get sent out in the wilderness. Joshua is going to be the leader. God is still in charge. Joshua has, was with Moses on a few of the divine encounters that Moses had. And in a few of them, God actually commissions Joshua, takes a portion of the spirit that's on Moses, puts it on Joshua, tells Joshua, you're the next leader. But Joshua has his own special encounter apart from Moses, which is Joshua 5, okay, the captain of the Lord's host. Now, I have angel here in the notes, because I think it's pretty, at least it's clear to me, that the captain of the Lord's host is the angel that has been leading them for the whole time. Why do I say that? Because the angel is described, or excuse me, the captain is described as the carbo shalufa beyado, with his sword drawn in his hand. That phrase, that concatenation, occurs two times elsewhere in the Old Testament. I have the verses here, Numbers 22, 23. Who's that? Remember the Numbers 22? Balaam. It's the angel of the Lord in the, in the Balaam incident. And 1 Chronicles 21.16 is also the angel of the Lord. 
Joshua has the same, again, status, the same divine encounter. We have the same God's ruling, God's observing, but God is meeting with Israel as an embodied human figure. Same as before, when, during Joshua's time. Joshua replaces Moses as the heir to the servant prophet role, but not the ultimate fulfillment, and that was Jesus. Israel is still God's son, his children. That role, the role of, again, the servant prophet, was supposed to be a king, and also the son of God role was supposed to be filled by a king once they had kings. Once you get in the land set up, set up the monarchy, we get kingships. How do I know that? Because when they actually get in there and have a king, that's what the kings call. Okay, the Lord said unto my Lord, okay, you have those passages, but you also have psalms that refer to the king as my, God says, my son. Because the king now embodies, the, 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 king, the king sort of subsumes, he, he stands in the place of the entire nation. The king is the nation. The nation is the king. Yeah, God knows that there's corporate and individual. But in the language that's used, we have a human being who's royal, who is there to protect and establish divine kingship, the kingship of Yahweh among the nations at a specific geographical place. He's supposed to be a servant, and he's also supposed to rule according to the law. The king, again, becomes the new Moses. Okay, he, he replaces. You have Moses. You had Moses over, and then you had, underneath Moses, you had a prince for each tribe. You had 70 elders. 70 is kind of an interesting number because that's the same number of nations that were disinherited back at Babel. Okay. God's son, God's family, is replacing the family he disinherited. There's 70 elders. When we get to Jesus, Jesus does something associated with that number too. But the king ultimately was supposed to, to have all these things sort of fuse the prophetic figure, the person who spoke for God. All these things were supposed to be focused on the king. And the king was supposed to carry the program through to its eschatological end. But the king fails. Joshua, of course, goes in, does what he's supposed to do. And if you actually look, I'm not going to, we don't have time to do this. You know, any one of these is like a two or three hour talk. If you actually plot the places, there are only four, five, six, you know, something like that, places that are put under the perem in the Old Testament. That's when everything living, every person living, sometimes even the animals, are to be killed. Okay, that isn't the usual mode of conquest. Usually the verb is drive them out, uh, you know, possess you know, their houses, and you know, God says, you're going to live in houses you didn't build, you're going to have fields you didn't plant, you're gonna, you know, everything's there for you. But on a few occasions, God said, go in there, and they have to be wiped out. If you plot those cities on a map, and then you go back to the list of people groups that are mentioned, I don't know, seven, eight, nine times, Rephaim, the Amorites, the Zuzim, the Amim, all these Eames, okay, that all of them trace their lineage back to the giant clans, the Nephilim in Genesis 6. They live at those places. Those are population centers of those bloodlines. Now, I, I don't, I've never seen that in print, but just do it yourself. You will find out. Even the Amorites. The Amorites are kind of a generic term when Joshua goes into uh, to I, AI, and they, and they lose because of what Achan does. He laments, you know, he tears his clothes and he says, oh, you know, we came all this way and now we're going to get beat, you know, by these Amorites. Amorites, according to the prophet Amos, were unusually tall. Okay, even them. Okay, it's a pattern. It's a pattern. In their thinking, there's something, there's something demonic going on here. And God says, those are the places you go in. And you, they are karam. They are offered up as a burnt whole offering to me. The other places, if they, they run out of town, fine. These are the places that are put under karam. 
And it's about bloodlines. I know it sounds kind of weird, but that, that, that's what it is in the Old Testament. So they don't complete the conquest. We finally get a conquest under David. Of course, Samuel is around when David's around. Divine embodiment continues into the time of Samuel. Samuel's the last judge. There were a few judges that witnessed the angel or, again, some form of divine embodiment. Uh, Gideon is, is probably the obvious example. And the Gideon passage is interesting because Yahweh and the angel are both in the same episode at the same time. So they're two individuals. In fact, one leaves and the other one's still there at the end of the story. But with Samuel, the same thing happens. This is one of my favorite passages in the Old Testament. I, I can't resist skipping First Samuel 3. Now the young man Samuel was ministering to the Lord, to Yahweh, under Eli. And the word of the Lord, the what? The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Oh, you mean they just didn't hear God? No, there was no frequent vision. First verse. It's something you see. Not just here, but something you see. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so he couldn't see, was lying down in his own place. You know, you know the story. Samuel goes to you know, lay down and he hears a voice. And he thinks it's Eli and he runs over there a couple times. And Eli finally figures it out and says, well, it's not me. So if it happens again, you say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. I'm all ears. I know it's not Eli. And that's what happens. If we go down here, verse 10, And the Lord came, Yahweh came, and stood. And he stands in front of Samuel, calling as at the other times. Samuel, Samuel. Samuel said, speak for your servant here. And then Yahweh pronounces the judgment on Eli's family. And you get to the end of the chapter. It's just great. And Samuel grew, and Yahweh was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. He had a divine encounter. Of course he's a prophet. That's what prophets are. It's what makes them prophets. They knew that he was established as a prophet of the Lord, and the Lord appeared appeared again at Shiloh, which is where Samuel and Eli were living. For the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh. How? By the word of the Lord. See, the word, sometimes in the Old Testament, is a human figure who is Yahweh. It's right there in the Old Testament. When, when John writes John chapter 1, he's not like, now which Greek philosopher should I quote here? Oh, I need, oh, I need some help from pagans. How do they talk about God? No. He knows his Old Testament. But that's what you'll hear in a lot of commentaries. John, you know, heavily influenced by Greco-Roman philosophy, writes his gospel. Well, I'm not saying he was totally uninfluenced. I am suggesting, though, that he knew his Old Testament pretty well. David is called the servant. He's the king. The king is the servant. He's my son. He's the son of God. Israel is now a kingdom of God on earth. David himself had a divine encounter. You look these passages up, 2 Chronicles 3. He meets the angel. You know, the, the passage says that Yahweh appeared to David, father of Solomon, and it connects it with Ornan, the Jebusite, back at the threshing floor. You go look at, the, at that passage, it's the angel. Solomon sees the same thing. Again, they're, they're kings, but they're also in this long line going all the way back to Adam. People who meet God and speak for God. Long line of the prophets. Okay, we have a failure under Solomon. Here, the word of the Lord is even rarer. Other than Solomon, we don't really get 
too much divine embodiment. We don't get it with kings at all after Solomon, because most of them are bad. Okay? But we do get it with prophets, what we think of as the classical prophets. And the prophets are called servants. My servant, the prophets. My servants, the prophets. You look at that string of verses in Isaiah. Everywhere you see servant in Isaiah, pretty much everywhere, it refers to the nation of Israel. It can refer to the prophet, which is why Jewish interpreters think that the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 is probably Isaiah. They don't want to see messianic overtones there. So they're not making that up. They're, they're looking, they're using the precedent of the rest of the book. But you also get a couple pagans referred to as my servants, Cyrus and later Nebuchadnezzar. Isn't it ironic that when it's time for Israel to get punished and it looks like the kingdom is over again, you know, kind of just like Babel, well, it's just not going to work. You know, I disinherited the nations back then, now I've got to disinherit my own kid. Isn't it ironic that when it, when it comes to that time, God calls two pagans from the foreign nations who had been disinherited and said, get up on your horse, I have a job for you. What it told the astute reader of the text was that, no, wait a minute. That means God's still in charge of like everything, including the nations that they're telling us that their gods beat our God. And, and we're in exile, and they're not. They conquered us. And we're like, what are we doing here? And the, the whole thing is over. It just, you know, went you know where in a handbasket. I mean, it just, it's, it's over. And God says, well, if you think that, then figure this out. Why is it that I'm commanding them? They're the only ones around to do my work that'll actually do it. So I've got to use them to bring you out of the muck where you're at. So there's a lot of irony there. Even after the exile, Israel is still called in Hosea the sons of the living God. They're still God's children. He accepts them back. But the kingdom is in exile. And the prophets get various messages to the exiles. Isaiah is sent to Israel, Israelites. Again, he sees the, the throne of God. It's a direct divine encounter. Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 1, read it. Read it closely. The word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah. Then like two verses later, that word of the Lord is called Yahweh. And then in verse 7 it says, And the Lord, Yahweh, reached out his hand and touched me. He's embodied. Again, it, it, it's a literary, it's a theological signal that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm still here. Just like I was in the old, I'm still here. Ezekiel, Ezekiel sees a man, figure of a man enthroned. Okay. Well, all the weird stuff he sees, that's pretty clear, that part. Now, where does this wind up? Here's the situation we have at the end of the exile. You have the corporate servant dying. Israel's in exile. Israel's toast. Rightly punished for sin. The corporate servant, though, is raised anew by anointed human agency, Cyrus in this case. Corporate resurrection. The nation, Ezekiel 37, goes through a whole picture of how the nation who is clearly dead, you're like really, really dead, when, you, when the bones have to be reassembled and the veins and all that stuff, you're dead. But the dead will come to life again in a very vivid way. And we even have third day imagery in Hosea, Hosea chapter 6, verse 2. Israelites are lamenting their situation. They say, well, even at the third day, he can still raise us up. The corporate servant can be raised up even on the third day. So you have the nation resurrected, but the glory and the kingship have not returned. And so you have more prophecy come, this time of a single servant whose ministry will mimic. Here's the part I want you to catch. The single servant's ministry, Jesus' ministry, mimics 
the corporate servant. Death because of the nation's sin and then resurrection. Once raised and resurrected, following the pattern that we've seen up to this point, what else would you have expected? Well, we need a king. If we have a kingdom resurrected, we need a king. And there's those, those, those nations, too. They, they still need to be brought into the fold because God disinherited them, but yet he's still clearly interested in them. And he's told us a couple times he's going to bring them back, and they're going to worship him. He will be their God. We need a prophet like unto Moses because that's still hanging out there. We need a priest who isn't from the Aaronic line, but, oh, yeah, there's that guy Melchizedek. We need a return of the glory of the presence of Yahweh. And we still need the original prophecy that started the whole ball rolling. We still need a human being that will undo the effects of the fall. Now, I want you to just look at this visually. We have here Jesus' bloodline back to Adam. Again, in parallel with some of the other bloodline issues that emerged in the primeval history. That's followed by a miraculous birth, okay, Abraham, Sarah, and Isaac. Well, the Gospels have that too. And then Israel, my son Israel, is taken out of Egypt. So is this son out of Egypt. In fact, Matthew says, yeah, he came out of Egypt because, like Hosea says, out of Egypt have I called my son. Corporate individual, corporate individual, the same things going on. You have deliverance under Moses at the baptism of Jesus. I mean, you, you have, again, you can, you can talk about you know, the water imagery or whatever. What's really going on is the, at the Exodus is a victory over the gods of Egypt and a rebirth of the nation uh, as God's son uh, to start up the kingdom again. It's interesting, at the baptism, God says, this is my son, so everybody can hear it. Of course, he comes to fulfill the law. We have the law at Sinai. The law, of course, points to Jesus. Jesus administers righteousness to his people and nations. And look at the passage quoted at, at Jesus' baptism. Isaiah 42. My servant. Then it's Israel. This time it's not. Because his life is mimicking, is echoing what happened to the corporate son. And they go into the wilderness. The corporate son fails, goes into the wilderness, which is associated with chaos and demonic forces. Jesus goes into the wilderness, <clears throat> and we have a victory over Satan. Satan offers him the nations. Isn't that curious? Bow down and worship me. It's, it's not an empty promise. I'll give you the nation. Jesus says, I don't think so. I got another way to get them. I don't, I don't need you to give them to me. What does Jesus do right after he defeats Satan in the wilderness? Luke chapter 10. He sends out disciples. How many does he send out? Seventy. Now there's a textual disagreement, seventy and seventy-two. It goes back into the Old Testament, 70 and 72. If you look in Genesis 48, the count there is given at 70, but the problem was is how to count Ephraim and Manasseh and all this kind of stuff. Uh, the, the tradition at 70 is very strong. And not only that, it lines up everywhere else. Over here, after we get wander around the wilderness, then we go into the, into the land under Joshua. Joshua's holy wars. He defeats all human and all semi-divine opposition. Well, Jesus does the same thing. The ministry of the 70 begins and coincides with the casting out of demons. The 70 cast out the demons. It's the only time in the Bible where demons are cast out is the New Testament. It begins with the Gospels. Why? Because it, is, it marks the inauguration, the beginning of the restoration of the kingdom of God. And in, 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 in this case, it ain't going to get overturned like it did before. Why not? Because all the other iterations in the Old Testament, who was God depending on? 
the corporate servant. You know those Israelites that kind of mess up a, little, a lot? He's not dependent on the corporate servant anymore. He's depending on the servant, who is him. His but isn't him. And he can guarantee that he'll, he'll pull it off. Transfiguration is interesting. Do a little study on the transfiguration. Where did it happen? Church tradition has Mount Tabor. If you look in your better commentaries, they will show why that doesn't work. There's, there, there's actually no textual support for it. If you follow the geography, the transfiguration would have happened somewhere near the foot of Mount Hermon. Anybody know where Mount Hermon is? Mount Hermon. So up in the Golan, yeah, that area. What territory was Hermon in? Dan. Dan overlapped with the region known as Bashan. Deuteronomy 3. And Bashan was home to giant clans. Hermon was also in Jewish tradition in the Book of Enoch was the place where the angels from Genesis 6 descended before they did what they did, Mount Hermon. And it's that place that Jesus picks to go and be transfigured. It's like, I'm back. I mean, if you're a Jew and you know your Old Testament and you know, you know all this other stuff that's written about the Old Testament, in the intertestamental period, you don't miss that. That is, that is what's, what's the phrase that we'd like to, to use now? Not holy war, but uh, what's the phrase that's kind of spiritual warfare? That is spiritual warfare. Jesus showing up at these places. By the way, in, in the Semitic world, Bashan, Bashan in Hebrew uh, is a geographical term, but it's also uh, a noun a common noun for serpent. Who would have thought that? At Ugarit, they had a dialectical difference. Their word for serpent was bathan instead of bashan. It's a little T-H-S-H interchange going on there. They actually described the region, and they considered it the gateway to the netherworld, the gates of hell, if you will. So that's where Jesus shows up. I just want to let you know who I am. We have the demise of the kingdom over here due to apostasy and unbelief. The son, Israel, is surrendered to the nations and their gods by God. Over here, the kingdom being offered is rejected along with its king. But that was God's plan too because he needs resurrection. The single servant needs to be resurrected to fulfill the imagery of the corporate servant who died and was resurrected. That's not the only reason God did that, but it's there in the text. So here we have, again, the whole thing with Cyrus, the anointed, the servant dies but yet lives. It's not the nation there. Prophecies of resurrection. And here we get Again, the shepherd, the Messiah, the servant, brings, del brings deliverance and dies, but it's raised on the third day. The nation of the kingdom is revived with him. Israel rises with him, because he is Israel. Progressing toward an unstoppable, and that's the key, the key idea, an unstoppable eschatological culmination. This one won't fail, because we're no longer trusting on mere human corporate servants. This time we have the servant. And if you stop to think about it, how else could it have all been pulled off? You've got servant thread meets, you know, in Jesus. You've got divine embodiment. I mean, he, he's, it's as though, and I think it is, Jesus is there the whole time in the Old Testament, just shepherding it along knowing full well back in Genesis that the only way we're, the only way we're going to get this back is if a human being does all this stuff to reverse the effects of the curse like which one of them that, that you know 
is going to, is going to do that. I'm going to have to become incarnated. I'm going to have to become them to flip the whole thing around. So everything converges in this one individual, and he, his life mimics deliberately. The New Testament writers, this isn't an accident. This is an intelligent mind guiding the New Testament writers to arrange the material as they did so that the readers would get the point. Now, Zach, uh, Dax has been going through, uh, I'm going to put this up real briefly. There's a lot more that could be hit on even before we get to the history of Israel, Abraham. There are a lot of other parallels that are, that are more primeval. But Dax has been talking preaching through Ephesians. And this, this was the thing that shocked Paul. He's astonished that the Gentiles are included in this. Why? Because they're the ones that were dissonant. They're the ones that messed up. I mean, they were the competing line. They're, they're the ones that always opposing this. Even by God's own design, God's own choice, God's own judgment. So in other words, for this whole thing to work out and to have redemption and to reclaim the nations, God is going to have... Something God did is going to have to be undone, and frankly, only God can do that. And so you have an incarnation. You have the wall of separation from the Gentiles being torn away. He is Israel, but the Gentiles are also his body. And you just think about it. Think about all the terms. The epistles use words like adoption. That's a really pregnant term against the backdrop of all this. It's a family term. There are lots of things in the New Testament that I'm going to encourage you, and this, is, this is our wrap-up here, I'm going to encourage you to filter through. Look for repetitions. Look for patterns. In, in, in academies, we call this intertextuality. It's not a fancy word for just saying Look at the text real closely where they use the same things. I think it'll, it'll, it'll give you a really solid backdrop so that when you read through your Bible, you'll be able to sort of pick out why writers are doing what they're doing, what they're telegraphing, what they're picking up, little threads they're picking up, and they're going to take it a little further. And they're going to drop it somewhere, and the next guy will pick it up. But it's a story. It's like a good novel, except it's not a myth. It's the myth that's true. Uh, that sort of thing, stealing that from Tolkien. I mean, it's a good story, and this is what's story. Tells.